London, yeah, directly. So I guess that's all. <laughs> You know, talking about political plays, you know, you're, uh, well, we had a long conversation about what your aspiration for your plays in Africa. And, um, you know, uh, there were some people in the audience that asked, asked for uh, context. And so would you put, like, Ghana and Africa in general in, in the context of that time? And we're talking 1961, right? Well, um, I don't have to to say that um, in the black world we have a lot of problems and um, my own conviction is that uh, there's a need for uh, more interaction between Africa and the diaspora for us to be able to solve some of these problems. Uh, unfortunately, um, our history, the way we are brought up, we are not, in Africa, we are not very conscious of the diaspora at all. Um, well, what we watch on television is what we see. I mean, um, you find many of our people say, I'm a nigger, you know, very proudly, uh, because they watch television and they see the tough people being there. So, uh, and also, it's only when we're outside of Africa that we are really conscious of being Africans. When we are in the continent, we are either Nigerians or Ghanaians or Igbo or, or Hausa and so on. So much division. Um, and yet, you, know, you see the whole world, people are coming together, forming large blocks and so on. Um, and uh, be able to, because the world is getting more and more, uh, I don't know what the word is, but more difficult, more cruel. Um, and uh, it is a sin to be weak. You know, we are very weak. Uh, unless we come together. You know. I don't think we can uh, get get far, and you will find that this Pan Africanist movement uh, began here, in fact, in America, um, very strong, particularly with uh, uh, um, Dr. Du Bois, you know, who, who was uh, and then moving to London in those days, and then coming to Africa itself. You know. Nkrumah was educated here in, uh, in America, Lincoln University. Then went to London. In those days of the colonial um, uh, situation, we, we were not free then. Uh, it, we, it was in the 1960s that this independence movement began to make meaning, and many countries became independent. The first country to be independent was Ghana. It was called the Gold Coast then, but you know, they changed the name to Ghana. Um, and uh, Mukrumah became president, and one of the things he did was to encourage uh, blacks from the uh, diaspora to come over and participate in the development of the country. So there were a lot of uh, uh, African Americans who came to Ghana in that first decade of independence and were very active in the, in the life there. Um, unfortunately, um, well, Nkrumah became more and more uh, dictatorial uh, because there was so much opposition for what he wanted to do. He wanted to build a big, very strong independent country. And in those days of the Cold War, you know, uh, it was being identified as somebody who, who drew a lot of leaning towards Moscow and so And so the CIA was against him. Um, so within 10 years, he was deposed 
uh, and a, a Western friendly government came there. But in those 10 years, you know, there was a remarkable progress. And um, a lot of unity between the African Americans and Ghana. Yeah, that's uh, actually, you know, what um, the, the, you know, your play, the moment of your play is really just the beginning of the, you know, the new Ghana, you know, to say. And, you know, all of these, in that period, all of these um, African nations were getting their independence as well as, you know, the civil rights movement was like kind of growing through the top. So there was like a great deal, as I recall, a great deal of hope for the black world. People identified themselves in a larger collective way. Would you say? Yeah, but it's gone now. Right? Yeah, right. But there was that, your play deals with that, that moment and these three young ladies who will become literary giants um, happened to be the same place at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, this, this was remarkable, I mean, that um, uh, these three uh, women were, you know, they were very young then, uh, you know, they, were, uh, they, they had not even really begun their literary careers, you know, and yet when they left, uh, um, they, they rose to become very famous figures, you know. Oh, in case people watching live stream, could you tell them who these women are that you're playing? Uh, Maya Angelou, everybody knows, yeah. The Maris Conde, who won the, 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 Alternative the, Nobel, uh, the Alternative Nobel last year. Uh, who, who won the Nobel if that has been cancelled. <laughs> so, and then if for Sutherland will be less known here because <coughs> she was Ghanaian, but very important in this. Theater, literary movement in Ghana, um, uh, the, the, the beginning of African drama. She was very, very uh, uh, important in this, trying to use the local traditions and so on to develop a new kind of uh, uh, theater and so on. So it was, uh, I was interested because I'm doing three plays on this issue, on this issue of the African and the African diaspora, you know, the, 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 the meeting, the, you know, how we can... So I'm doing three plays on that, um, on that period. And the first one was on Dr. Du Bois, you know, who died in Ghana. You know. uh, then this time I thought I should look at the female um, aspect of this. It was in looking at it that I found remarkably that these three women were in fact there at that time, you know, that participated in that experience. <coughs> Unfortunately, they didn't write much about their political involvement. I don't know whether that was strategic, uh, but they did write about their personal and uh, uh, their personal relationships when they were there. So this, this is just uh, my own, um, uh, what do I call it, my own story on these uh, three women there. Oh, you mean it didn't actually happen? It didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were, I, mean, uh, I don't know what uh, the degree of their uh, involvement in this uh, story, of, but I just imagine the kind of people they were. And how about you, Francis? How about the context of the Haitian Revolution? I think people, you know, there were a couple of people asking the other night about the context. Of, and I think what they meant is like, in, in the history of the new world, where does the Haitian Revolution sit? Well, it started in 1791 and we gained our independence in 1804. Most of the world was still, the, the slave trade was still happening. Uh, and I, I mean, a lot of the way that Haiti has been regarded uh, since then has to do with um, Europe and America and a lot of countries not wanting um, 
slaves to insurrect the way that Haiti did. Um, but it also, uh, the Louisiana Purchase happened as a result of events um, in the Haitian Revolution. Frederick Douglass was an ambassador to Haiti for many years. Um, there's a little bit in, in my play about Toussaint Louverture's relationship with President Adams and then President Jefferson. President Adams was um, very supportive of the revolution and Jefferson was not. Uh, so we've, we've been a, a very connected and in conversation and um, with the rest of the world, but there has definitely been a <coughs> deliberate effort to marginalize our country since then, and uh, it's, it's tragic. Um, but I mean, I, I, I just remain so inspired by that event um, in Haiti because it's really remarkable what was accomplished and um, the impact that it had on other countries. Um, that it eventually led to a lot of, I mean, France, during the Haitian Revolution, France not only abolished slavery in uh, Saint-Domingue, but all of their colonies. Um, they abolished slavery in all of their colonies. And so when Bonaparte took power and was threatening to reestablish slavery, uh, Louverture and Dessalines and, and the people of the, the revolution, they weren't just fighting to maintain uh, freedom in Saint Domingue, but all of the colonies that where slavery had been abolished, and they, you know, the, their plan was to continue helping other countries. So, I mean, I don't know if that answers your question yeah. as far as context with the rest of the world. Um, but, I think so. Yeah. No, it was other people that kind of asked that kind of general question, you know. And I mean, I, I, I think the way of struck, I mean, it makes, it makes, you know, um, you know, the slave trade and just how it developed the, you know, the, the, the Western world. I mean, that was, must have been very dangerous for the rest of the world mm -hmm. for, for there to be a black republic, mm -hmm. you know, in the Western uh, hemisphere. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, like, there were a lot more slave revolts than history would like to. That was just a bad example. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of a thing, you know, that you know, had to be put down. Yeah. And even the, the perception of voodoo and um, you know indigenous spiritual traditions is a result of um, preventing any more insurrection in any of the other slave colonies. And you know, like Brazil has its own version, kind of like like all of these countries, Santeria and Cuba, like they all have their own versions, and they're mostly regarded as um, evil. <laughs> You know, witchcraft, and, and that's why. Well, but if we don't look at those things from like a, a white lens, you know, like what we would call Judo and Santa Teresa, mm -hmm. and, you know, what they do in Brazil, you know, it's very much the same yeah. exactly. thing, yeah. right? Exactly. It's an African thing. Exactly, yeah. but I, that's what I'm saying is that uh, European and American slave owners, they uh, perpetuated this idea that it was something evil and, and really pushed Christianity because they didn't want uh, they didn't want blacks to to gain that power because they, they gained a lot of strength and power and it was a way for them to stay connected to their African roots and so that's where all that came from but then it, it gets passed down because you know when I was growing up I grew up in Miami I mean the way people regarded voodoo is one thing but then I I mean, I'm black, I think of myself as black, but in Miami, people didn't, black Americans didn't consider me black. They were like, well, she's not black, she's Haitian, whatever that means. And, um, and Haitians were really regarded um, very negatively. Um, and even this history is not taught to us. It's not taught at all, it's not taught at all. I mean, it wasn't taught at all in school when I was growing up in America, at all. Um, I don't think. It's being taught now. No, no. You mean the history? Which, which of oh, the history that we're talking about? Yeah. Right. No, no, it's not taught. 
know, uh, <coughs> um, well, you know, it's you know, there's 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 history about it that explains a lot of things, mm -hmm. you know, which, you know, and that's why it's extracted from history. I mean, like I think I I mentioned to some of you the other day that just uh, was in the Guardian that you know the British abolished slavery in 1833. Well, it took a lot of while for it right, <laughs> right. before, you, before you actually, you know, got off the farm, but got off the plantation. But uh, they borrowed, the British government borrowed money to buy out the slaveholders. It wasn't reparation. It was like, you know, buying the slaves at exorbitant prices for the landowners. Because slavery made, well, I think this example will give you an idea of how much money slavery made. Um, they took out that loan in 1834, and, and the loan was paid, guess what? 20th century? Mm -hmm. 2015. Wow. Right? And so, you know, I, I, it, 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 to give you an idea of the enormous impact of slave labor and human trafficking has had on, like, really creating the Western world, right? You know, it, it, huh? I was gonna say. I just saw something funny on Twitter the other day that said um, black people should never have to pay for anything made of cotton ever again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you know, so the scope of that. So if you look at history from that lens, then you see different things, right? You know, you, you definitely see the bullshit. And our connection to each other, you know, um, a lot of the Maroons came from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were all connected, everybody in the, in the West Indies. A lot of the slaves in Haiti, in Saint-Domingue, were directly from Africa because the conditions were so harsh that um, the lifespan was very short. So there weren't that many slaves who were born in San Domingue. They were constantly bringing like, like Africans. So it was predominantly Africans. Yeah. I think that's uh, one of the high points, to get back to your very first question about the experience we had in Cassis, was that we were able to share that, you know, not just as descendants of uh, these uh, as slaves, but also as, as artists. We could share our experiences, and uh, it was a revelation for me in many instances. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this, for me, brought about you know, the question of how complex the idea of diaspora has become. And I often question myself, like, how long does a society need to be or a group of people need to be referred to as a diaspora, would we not sort of integrate into different cultures? Because the problems with diaspora would be, the idea of a diaspora would be multiple identities, the diaspora versus homeland or nationhood. And I think about the situation of Brazil, for instance, where it's taking over 600 years, but then you refer to Africa as, as the homeland and the cultural production from, from the Afro-Brazilian um, society has been included as part of Brazil's nat national cultural heritage. So on the one hand, you have diasporic consciousness and on the other national cultural identity which are sort of antithetical to each other mm -hmm. but then they operate par in parallel yeah. lines. Mm -hmm. so it's kind of an interesting dynamic so I wonder would we then have a perpetual diasporic existence? Would there ever get to a point where we where we are people other than the diaspora? say 500 years from now. But can we be both? Yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm saying. It okay. comes up with a lot of yeah. you know, multiple identities or even dual identities. You hardly ever have, you know, anyone who's a diasporic individual now would probably be in possession of more than one or two passports or three passports. 
and then you, you find yourself shared in several homelands, mm -hmm. several continents, in a way. And then you think about it. How would this, how would this play out in maybe a couple of years from now? Because in the case of uh, Afro-Brazilian religions, I study Kanoble. And I found it very interesting that Kanoble, which was um, initially discriminated against and criminalized. It's a religion. It is a religion. It's, a, it's, it's so like it's a, voodoo, yeah. a variation of the voodoo from, from, from Haiti and um, Santeria yeah. and Cuba. Mm -hmm. Initially, it was criminalized for, for the same reasons she mentioned. And over the years, it was accepted as part of Brazil's cultural heritage. And now I find that there are even people who are practicing the religion who are not of African ancestry, mm -hmm. and who, who, refer to as, who refer to Africa as, the, uh, as a spiritual uh -huh. homeland. You know, so it's... it's <laughs> Yeah, it's that's, 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 well, that's very, the thing is, you know, I've always said that, like, you know, that like America is a cultural colony of Africa. You know, like most of you know the diaspora. I mean, like, if you take Africanness out of really a lot of world culture, you wouldn't have very much to it. You know, you wouldn't have very much to it. So that there, are these, there are these kinds of like intangible things that kind of make us, you know, like you say, like the religions, like Santa Teresa and stuff. I mean. They seem to emerge out of groups of poor people. Mm -hmm. have, it's not like they're communicating with each other about like, you know, how we will worship and do this thing. I mean, this thing just kind of happens, you know, grows like weeds or, or spreads like a like a virus. You know, this kind of African this thing. You know? mm -hmm. I was just going to say, you know, that issue, interestingly enough, has not been dealt with in Africa itself. And you know, until we did, I mean, the whole slave experience is probably the largest collective experience we've had. Mm -hmm. But it has not been dealt with, you know, mm -hmm. in Africa itself. And some of the, the things that you were talking about, the religious revival and others, if you came to Nigeria, some you may even get bonds. Yeah. By fanatical Christians mm -hmm. Muslims. And, and, and Muslims. But it's the same in Haiti. It's the same in Haiti too. Like most Haitians, yeah, you know. food or yeah. like. Because we've been, we've been persuaded we've been, that this thing is evil. It's pagan. It's not, you are not supposed to, 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 to even recognize any of these deities. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know. It's interesting. I mean, it, 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 what's happening over there and what's happening at home. Yeah. Uh, some of this, of course, is being changed, but we haven't until we actually deal with this. Yeah. No, seriously. The, there were slaves who sold the slaves. Who are the people? Who, what is happening today in, in contrast to what happened before? We really need to deal with that issue in Africa itself. We haven't, you know, we haven't dealt with this question. Well, you know, it's not universal, but in my, my time in Africa, my, you know, people were very welcoming to me. And it seemed that there was kind of like a caveat that like I was one of the lost ones. You know, <laughs> and uh, I was like, you know. How long ago? So, sorry, brother. You know, um, <laughs> you know, you know, in 81 before, you know, before the, you know, the diamond. But I, so I, I think it's a lot about preservation too, like the, when you're talking about the diaspora, because I mean, I can speak more for Americans, but like I've had people tell me, because I identify as Haitian American, and like I had once somebody asked me, well, when are you going to drop the hyphen? Like you've been here since <laughs> you're a baby, you know? But I don't, and I'm an American citizen, but I don't want to because I feel like. It, it would take maybe two, three generations before my descendants don't know anything about our culture. I mean, but but by the way, it's been it's been so it's been enforced so much that it's 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 going to stay. That's what I mean. As I speak for Brazil, you mean the hyphen? Yeah, the, like the hyphenated uh, identities, Afro-Brazilian. I mean, there's there's so many people who have adopted it who are not 
African ancestry. And this uh, religion has transcended racial barriers to open up to just about anyone. Once you accept the idea of Yoruba cosmological beliefs, then you're you're yeah, you're. I think it's very different here, mm -hmm. don't you think? What's it's that? very different here. Uh, oh, you mean the way people practice Sagittarius? Yeah. Not, not Sagittarius, I'm just talking about the connection to the African... Continent? Yeah. Um, and maybe because so many Americans have been here for so many generations and they don't know where exactly they come from, they feel like their story started here. I don't know. Well, for um, Brazil, there's been a back and forth on this because um, after the slave trade was abolished in Brazil, they were the last. Uh, was the last. Yeah, in 1888. Abolished slavery, yeah. Um, but there was still a couple of um, Yoruba people who went back, back and forth just to get knowledge. It wasn't like, oh, they asked them to on the slave ships, pack your bags and they packed all your stuff, you know. <laughs> but it was going back and forth and getting knowledge and which they do to this day, you know. And they have that connection because I thought the idea of a homeland was illusory because there are a lot of contingencies that had happened after the slave the slave um, slave trade. A very big one called colonialism that has wiped you know, the idea of um, this kind of religions and, and beliefs from, from most African minds. So for Brazil, it's really very, it's very strong. It's, it's, it's really vivid. It, it has infiltrated almost everything from music to food to literature, movies, everything. You, you would, there's the national dish for Brazil is the feijoada, which it's a soul food here, like we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And there's this essay that uh, says soul food cannot be feijoada because in a place like the US, a cultural dish from from a minority can never ever be uh, a national and dish. I think, I think that's the thing is that, I was just talking about this with some other playwright friends of mine not too long ago and because slaves in America were so dis, you know, disconnected from Africa and they were separated, tri you know, people from the same tribes were separated, they were separated from children. So they eventually, you know, we had to create our own culture. Black American culture is its own specific culture, right? But in America, black Americans have never really had true equality. We've had to keep fighting, so I think it's different when you're in, you know, in Haiti, it's the it's a black majority nation, so there's not that sense of having to really um, create and guard your own identity and your own culture. It was already there. It's been, you know, it's been. Oh yeah. Do you know, do you yeah, know I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but also so, there, there, there's, there was this eradication, this deliberate. Uh, destruction of having you hold on to that identity. Right, so, so, the, so the consequence is that we, as black Americans, created our own, our new culture. And so I think, so what my friends were saying, it's difficult to start thinking about their connection <coughs> to where their ancestors came from oh, because yeah. they've had to fight to create this culture here and are continuing to fight well, I think that's that's gone on through, throughout the Atlantic Basin, mm -hmm. and I think that what 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 I mean by um, you know African culture, just like African American culture, is created by black people, mm -hmm. right? You know, because you know part of the um, mechanism for social control is you know um, it was like planned. It just didn't put people in ships mm -hmm. together. They made sure they were different languages, right. different, so they couldn't you know connect with each other and revolt. Practices that you had. It was their intention to erase, in a generation, you know, practices that, you know, you repeat that were cultural practices. So, so all those people, all those people in the hemisphere, whatever they made, you know, they made themselves. Right? Now, they must have cobbled it together from some stuff. I mean, the people who were like Yoruba, right, the French, said, well, you can go to the Catholic Church, right? You know, they go to the Catholic Church and they say, 
Oh, sacrifice. Shango oh, is the same thing. It's just like back home. You know, and they build their kind of area. You know, they appropriate it. Now, the way that history inter interprets what we do mm -hmm. is imitation. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, but, you know, we're human beings. We're cultural animals. Right? You know, spiders make webs. Bees make honey. <coughs> people make culture. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think afro atlantic culture is so many. Because it, it was created in an environment where culture was denied them. Millions of us, which is probably, probably was no work anyway, right? But, you know, um, so I, you know, I think that is, you know, I think there are, there are distinctions in that phenomenon, you know, there's what, you know, there's what happens in like Bahia, you know, um, you know, then there's my, I mean, even in modern day, you know what I mean? Like, you know, if you travel around, you go like, whoa, didn't I just see that, you know? <laughs> You know, and you know, how does that, I mean, in art, for example, you know, that phenomenon, like people like Robert Ferris Thompson has been, you know, studied pretty thoroughly. You know, like Congo sculptures, where they be doing that, whatever that means, and it means all kinds of stuff like that. But you know, you know, well, you see that in the reggae, you know, or, you know, a Congo or sort of kinds of whatever, where you couldn't carry the objects, but you could carry the meaning in your body, you know, I mean, and I just think those things, are, you know, there is the oppression, and then there is what um, black people manifest out of the oppression to deal with their trauma or heal themselves. Mm -hmm. That's the thing which, I don't know, I think it's our role to... To highlight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Say something, brother. The camera's running. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you said the other evening, um, you, know, you used an example of a stick uh, oh. that, you, that you saw somewhere, you know, that uh, was uh, an old guy carving, of carving a stick. Yeah. Right? And that, that uh, that's the same image that would have been carved, you know, uh, some years ago in Africa. But, I thought about that, and, 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 and another example, I was in Ghana uh, some years back, and I was at a museum, and there was this uh, video of Michael Jackson dancing, but it was, it was interposed with uh, another image of African dance, and the corollary, the similarities between what you saw in terms of movement was just amazing, and they, they did it deliberately to show you. But, you know, how similar those movements were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm fascinated at how we've carried over this dynamic, this, uh, this unconscious gene. Yeah, 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 yeah. How permeates our work. Yeah. Well, um, you know, in, in, in my case, you know, my, my people are Geechis, the Gullah people, you know, they come from the, the Sea Islands. And, and the situation for, for um, you know, my family's people is that um, they were probably bought from the Grain Coast because right? um, they could cultivate rice. The Europeans didn't know how to make rice, but the South Carolina Sea Islands with the marshes was a perfect place to like grow, grow rice. So, so the, you know, the language that is Gullah that people talk, which, which is like a combination of English uh, and some Timne and Mende words from that same, from that same, same coastal place. So growing up, you know, people speaking that in the house, you know, there was, it was just like an African thing. So it wasn't like an abstract idea, you know, you're like, you African, that's it, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> that's the way it goes, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I guess it sort of, but, you know, going back, you know, when I was in Africa in 81, when I went to Freetown, because I, I had to go someplace where they spoke English, you know, like, <laughs> You're driving me, you know, when you, you go somewhere, you just have to you totally surrender yourself to, you know, your host when you're in another, in another world. So I went, I, I went to Free Town and I could understand what people were saying, mm. you know, and it was, and I realized this, this must have been the Great Coast because it's just like the color that I heard when I was a kid, you know, which I thought it just like evaporated from my mind, you know. Mm. And, um, so, you know, those people carried those remnants of language and stitched together and made something which was, you know, comfortable for them, you know. Yeah. Culture making. Just, you know. yeah. um, perhaps you guys like to join in on the conversation?
No? <laughs> oh, I have a question for Francis Luce. Uh, I think your play was very well researched, and I wanted you to talk a little bit about uh, your process of like uh, researching and writing, I'm a playwright, so like researching and writing at the same time. Without it being like that. Sure. Well, there was definitely a period that was that I was just researching, especially before I started part one, to try to put things into context. Um, and I remember early on, uh, one of my main sources was the Black Jacobins. Um, mm. It's very dense. I mean, it took me like a couple years to get through that book. But sometimes, you know, I'd read about things, and like the character of Valentine came to me out of something that I, that I read in that book about um, during the French Revolution when, when a lot of uh, people from France were, were coming to Saint-Domingue. Um, so there's a little bit of crossover because I would, I would discover things and make a note, like that, that could be a character, that could be an event. Um, but I, for the most part, started with research and once I found my two, um, Cecile and Valentine, then I felt like I could start to craft the story. Um, and then part two, I went back to research because I knew part two was going to be, there was going to be a lot of focus on Louverture and Dessaline, and so I, I, it was a kind of a lot of back and forth. I created my own timeline of all of the event, the historical events. So I would refer back to the, the timeline that I created, the events that I thought were important in terms of not necessarily the history of the revolution, but events that I thought were important in the arc of those characters. So I kind of had to rearrange things. And uh, some of the events that happened in the play, I kind of rearranged the order because I was thinking more in terms of the character art, as opposed to um, the history, uh, but uh, it's been difficult. <laughs> it's not easy. There's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot because there's a lot to remember, and there's a lot. Like sometimes I have to, I have to go back to, to feed myself again, uh, and especially when I would get caught up in when the creative process stopped being fun and started feeling <laughs> like laborious, I would stop and go back to the history and to get re-inspired and, and re, um, just to connect with the feeling that I had when I first wanted to write this play because I could really get caught up in the process and then it just started feeling like a homework assignment or like, <laughs> am I gonna do this? So I had to keep going back and forth to, to get that, uh, that soul connection again. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Well synthesized. Yeah. yeah, but I don't know if there's a one. There's one way to do it. I think you know. Every artist will find find their their method. Yeah, yeah I um. Introduce yourself. Introduce myself. I'm Mary Moore Easter. I'm a playwright and a dancer. And I, um, there have been two mentions of the present and the future and the ways that, I mean, we know many of the ways that reflections on the past will apply, but um, Ms. Jalo particularly has um, seen diaspora as, um, has explored diaspora as something of people who are much older and who are living into the end of their years, right. which seems to me to be the present and the future because they're not in their places of origin. That is a part of the story. And the end of Fleming's play um, proposes um, a, different, a different possibility instead of simply tracing the outcome of uh, past practices. Uh, with the women dancing, I mean, and there's also this, there's a question in here somewhere, I'm going to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but there is the, the possibility of choosing a different outcome as the creative artist. Uh, 
um, and there's a line in yours that says it's not going to end in the same old disappointing way because the playwright doesn't want it to. I was given a lot of permission by, <laughs> by your saying that. So I sort of wanted to follow up on that idea of um, the present and the future in, in the terms of what is what we are investigating and uncovering in the past. Some of us are uncovering it for other people for whom it hasn't been uncovered. Okay, but um, does that spur any responses? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what was the question? <laughs> well, the question is about the future, about, I guess the question is really about um, how to represent um, these stories of the past moving into the present and the future. And there are choices to tell, first of all, what actually happened or what you surmise came out of it. Um, but it seemed to me that your choice was to invent a new thing based on the women, and then the women are dancing, and they're going to dance in a new way, and it's going to have different meanings, and then we all get up, and we the audience actually demonstrates that. So my question is to talk about that. That's a choice that you made. Well, it's like naturalism versus realism, right? In, in theater. Oh. Oh. I mean, oh. I can. <laughs> I mean, I have two thoughts about that. I, I, I do believe that the work that's been created invites the audience mm -hmm. to think about the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even if it's, you know, if my plate's all in the past, but it invites mm -hmm. the audience to think about what is possible, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the, you know, the, the simple answer, like for, for me, I've talked about Part three, my intention in part three is to move, jump way ahead 100 years from now because I've had that experience in researching the Haitian Revolution. Almost every documentary I've ever seen ends with, and now Haiti is blah, 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 blah. And it's like very hopeless. And I don't, I don't want that to be the end of my, I want the end of this trilogy to be about what is possible for Haiti in the future. Thank you. Uh, you know, the, um, you know, a play, um, a contemporary play that deals with history, is not a history play. It's a contemporary play. Mm, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, so it's, you know, because, you know, you weren't there. I mean, even history itself is, you know, in some ways a fiction, right? Because, you know, two people experience an event. You know, me and Chuck experience something, then we walk away and I tell France to lose and it's just a little bit different because <laughs> she's the audience, you know. So, um, so this construct that we have of history or whether, whether it's true, I think, I think as Americans in particular, we're not pretty like lazy about it is, about what, like for example, France Luce is doing, you know, as a, with a historical construction, right? It is through her eyes you know, looking at like a past event, mm -hmm. so it's it's something else other than, mm -hmm. than history, mm -hmm. you know, or you know, or a commentary in history. And it's unlike a history book; it tries to derive. It's happening in the theater, so it tries to derive consensus. So I don't know; it's a little a little mm -hmm. different. I wish people would maybe be um, yeah, I mean, history to receive it, see those yeah. plays in that way. Yeah, what, what, what really is history? History, you know, there are very many versions, <laughs> and um, uh, it's the conqueror, the, the one, the victor, who, who writes history, who tells us what history is, you know, with the big H. But we know there are several histories, and um, I'm always trying to do those things to interpret history from the side of the losers, you know. From the, I, I, I once described it as history from the lower side. You know, uh, the victims have their own version. You know, particularly, if we come from a colonized uh, zone. For a long time, we were chanting, you know, "Long live uh, the, the queen." We were 
waving the flags of, of Great Britain, you know, and so on. You know. That's what the history was then. Now, now we are rewriting the history. But in fact, I am only interested in that rewriting in as much as it empowers the present and helps us into the future. So the, 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 my interpretations are also very much in, in, you know, uh, affected by the current debate that's going on. Um, in Nigeria now, there's a lot of talk about the role of women, women in politics. Uh, you see that in South Africa, half of the cabinet now is female. Uh, you know, there's still a lot of resistance to that in Nigeria. Um, um, some of the females who have you know, participated in power have been uh, great looters, you know, uh, robbers, you know, uh, thieves. But um, you know, but that's just a few, and they, 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 they were they were agents of, uh, of certain powers. That, you know, not acting independently of. You know, in, and in certain cases where we have had independent women and others, they've been very exemplary, you know. Very, very, you know, strong and positive leaders, you know. So you see, here I'm trying to also get into that debate that the women should, you know, also uh, be given prominent roles, let them try to take over power from all our male as of the so that, 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 that's the context in which uh, you see that play. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. I have a question. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, about your choice to be in theater. Did you choose theater or did theater choose you? With the different works you're doing, you're all doing, to my ears, um, social change, social justice work. Why is it that you're in our business? Well, I, I, I could say I've always been fascinated by alternative um, ideas to, to what's, what, what obtains and um, the idea of dialogue and writing, writing stories the way one would want to have them. And for me, writing comes easier than, it, it's my, my most favorite way of communication. And I always like to put alternative events on paper that way. If it wasn't this way, could it be that way, for instance? And um, it's just simply that. And I'm just fascinated by dialogue and what dialogue could do in terms of how 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 dialogue can take on different forms in, in terms of uh, theater, and I've always been interested in, in theatrical productions and have been inspired by Femi Oshofison. Actually, he's the reason I I am a playwright because I I was first fascinated by his style of writing. Uh, weaving myth, myth, mythology with um, contemporary issues and how he would put in music and the musicality of his, his language too. So I'm really honored to, to, to be on this panel with him actually because I've looked up to him for so many years. <laughs> yes, I'm also very proud to be <laughs> I mean, you know, to see that um, something, i be able to influence something that is so good and so, which is enormously talented. So I'm very proud as you mentioned. <laughs> uh, yes. I'm just here for the money. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a cheap day. Yeah, it definitely, yeah, I mean, it definitely, I feel like it chose me because uh, it's, it's like, it's a peculiar life. 
um, to be a playwright. Uh, and I, I started as an actor, but it was really just so random how I ended up in an acting class at 11 years. I didn't know anything about it. I had never seen a play, but my friends were doing it, and so I did it, and I fell in love immediately. And uh, I, I loved performing, and when I started writing, uh, you know, I was a big daydreamer. <laughs> you know, I had a lot of fantasies, and when I started writing plays, it was like, oh, those are people and characters, and that's what, so I, I think it was meant to be. And then, uh, you know, I talked a little bit about this um, during the talk back after my play, that when I started writing plays, um, in a few, a few years after I started writing plays, I started really deep diving into my own identity as a Haitian American, and um, that's when I felt really driven to tell our stories because no one was. I, you know, I grew up in America. I never saw anything about Haiti on TV unless it was something negative on the news. It was never nothing. It was never mentioned in school. There was never any movie. Like there was not. Like we did not exist. So I felt like, well, this is what I have to do. Like, you know, I, we exist. I kind of uh, tripped into theater in the sense that I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, and then I realized that mm -hmm. you know, uh, acting was parallel to being a lawyer as well, uh, to some extent. <laughs> Um, but I, I learned on my journey in the theater that theater could be a powerful tool for changing society. And when that hit me, that notion hit me, I, I see audience members who would come to watch a play and they, they talk about what they've seen. Some even said that they reviewed behavioral patterns that they had and they thought differently about what they could do on one level, but then I got more involved in, in the area of theater for development where we actually went into communities and I was able to see communities transform at the behest of a play. Uh, that's theater with the people, by the people, and for the people where they become the agents of change by performing a play themselves and you become more or less like a facilitator. But they're performing about uh, issues in their lives, whether that's a, 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 a road that needs to be transformed, whether that's the issue of female circumcision, whether that's the issue of uh, poverty, education, health, uh, issues that go on, etc. And I, I've actually seen communities take their own uh, power back and, and make change, substantive change in their community. So that's what keeps me in there, the fact that I know that it can have that impact. Um, my mentor, uh, Walishenko once said something to the effect that when we have the opportunity to arrest eyes and ears, it pays sometimes to put something in front of them to let them know something about the sordidness that exists around us. Right? And I firmly believe that. I think that we, we have that almost as a duty to do as artists. Uh, let me say that um, when we talk of theater, the the, 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 the the phenomenon we grew up with is totally different from what we're doing here. Um, uh, nowadays, the, the, the growth of film and video and uh, has a bit tempered this down, but in on stage in Nigeria, this is where I come from. The audience is an active participant. <coughs> They're answering back, thinking with you, right, you know. So, I mean, it, it, it's not like here where you listen politely and, you know, it's after the show that you now. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, when you, that kind of experience is very fascinating. You, you get into it. You know. um, again and again having the audience talk back. I mean, the audience doesn't wait till after the play to tell you whether it's good or not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they, they can stop the play. I, mean, I have had very interesting experiences um, acting one of Molière's plays, for instance, you know, 
Um, uh, what the title again? He won. No, 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 it wasn't uh, the adaptation. It was the, where the woman is deceiving the, the man so much, um, cuckolding him, and then, but he, he is so a stupid man, he has to beg her and all that, you know. She, she goes up to her by lovers and comes by, and then, uh, you know, he has to beg her <laughs> to enter the house. And she insists that she must go down on his knees. And I wanted to go down, the audience said, no, you must not. <laughs> <laughs> but the play had to continue, I didn't know. But the director would no, don't go down. <laughs> and finally, when I went down, I mean, that was the end of the play. Went out. He's a stupid man. <laughs> you know that kind of you know, involvement. You know, uh, you know, we, we had to hide a thief. You know, you know <laughs> hiding within the audience at the point. You know, and the man comes in. Where is this man? And the people say, but he's here. <laughs> well, they keep saying, but where is this man? Are you mad? We are saying he's here. <laughs> You know, and finally they carry him and throw him onto the stage. That's the man you're looking for. <laughs> you know, many, many, many incidents like that. You know, so you know, you really get involved with theater that way. You know, um, and uh, you know, this is really what makes for what we call the theater uh, for development, which we have been talking about. You know, we go into communities and you know, you can really influenced the society because they, they see the thing, they learn immediately, they participate and so on. You know. um, well, so this question of um, this new theatre we are trying to involve, which we, we deals with words. It's really, uh, it's not really a real practice there. You know. um, there's music, there's dance, there's everything, total theatre. In our, in our own experience, and that's what we've been trying to to see how we can modernize and put a modern stage and so on. So that that that's the fascination we think. We tried to generate a bit of that at the end of Femi's uh, play by mm -hmm. inviting the audience to become a part of that journey of the women in dance as well. So that, that participatory nature. In fact, um, you know, this is so good because um, the number of my plays, the ending is decided by the audience. Uh, you know, the actors don't decide themselves. We ask the audience to <laughs> decide the, and they, they, they tell us what to do. So this is really very, very entertaining, very interesting. Yeah, uh, I was uh, kind of wondering that it, it seems like in a lot of the, the plays from this weekend and, and a lot of the media experience that we get is people here in America um, almost feels like we are a uh, abducted child trying to find our way back home. We're looking and searching for our history. We're looking and searching for our ancestors, for the people who gave us life, gave us our culture, how that culture is so deeply embedded in our genetic and, you know, history. Um, but what I don't see a lot of, and I, I spent a little, a, a little bit of time in, in South Africa just after um, Mandela was uh, elected president, um, where the South Africans welcomed black Americans welcomed our money, welcomed our, our interests, um, but categorized us as Americans. And not necessarily their brothers or descendants or long lost family welcomed home. Um, so, you know, I guess my question is, Femi and, and, and Carla, you talk about looking forward, looking to the future. In terms of that, what what do you see as necessarily generating from Africa, generating from 
South America, so to speak, or generated from the Caribbean in terms of we are looking, they are looking for us. They are looking to bring us home. They are looking to show us some sort of light or some sort of way or some sort of pathway to, if not repatriating, but welcoming us back. Because I don't, I see a lot of us reaching out, but I don't see a lot of that coming this way. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it seems to me just the opposite. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, first of all, I think um, when when I, you know, I, when I went, I, I guess I was looking for. Uh, I, I went to Africa in '81. I went by myself. I got a grant and I took a plane to Dakar and I just started walking, you know, just searching for my roots. I guess it was pretty, uh, kind of crazy. But, uh, so there I was, I was an African American in Africa looking for my African identity. And what I discovered was how much of an American I was. And it was, you know, just like, you know, day-to-day -day cultural behaviors, you know, like, like waiting, you know. Like, like, you know, like I was in a car park and the brother got me a ticket. I was going to go to Conakry and, um, you know, the guy said, we'll be leaving in a little while, you know. And, uh, you know, a little while I said, we, we didn't even like when it was dark. Well, it didn't take me long to like, you know, like, hey, I want my money back. Where? What are we doing this holiday for, you know? And everybody was like, what is the matter with this guy? You know, they were crowding around, sort of observing me. So, you know, those are things which, you know, were habits that you, you know, there's one kind of culture that you go, that you grew up with, you know, just the habits of sort of kind of behavior, you know, and that there's, you know, so that's who I am. I'm like an African American. I'm not, you know, I'm not, there's no, I can't go back. Right? That's you know that's gone. I mean, it can become something else, and I don't mean that that's negative. So that that idea of I think everybody experienced that. I mean, I did a solo show about that. Full on, you run into people and said, "Oh, the same thing happened to me." You know, I went to Russia, went to Kiev, and everybody looked like my grandmother, and I hated the food. You know, what I mean? so you know there is this sort of humanist quality that intersects, which you know makes the whole thing kind of complicated and personal. I had a different experience, uh, and which which enabled me to be, begin to see that you get out of an experience sometimes what you put into it. Right? I didn't go looking for roots, looking for. I went curiously looking to looking for for tools from my from the roots of my culture in which I could use to embellish my craft. Mm -hmm. Um, as an artist, so I, I went with curiosity. I went to learn, and over a period of time, I found myself giving and taking from from the culture there as, as well. And so much that I was given a wife and two children from that soil. So I, I, I married the continent as well in that mm -hmm. respect. But along the journey, I taught. I started a theater company, and um, you just discovered that it's give and take. And I think if more people went with that notion, then you'd see more of that reaching out. But you had a destination. You had a place to go to. You know, you, you know the spot, right? You, I mean, you were Nigerian. I mean, you, you, you came from America, but you were a Nigerian going back home. No, 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 I, I went, I went as an African American whose parents are from the south of this, you know, of this country, right, and I went afresh, I just graduated out of college, I had this Fulbright ITT fellowship to do one year there, and that one year turned into 30, right, and that, that was because I, I went with a, I think I went with an open slate, <clears throat> with, a, with a clean slate. I didn't go with any expectations, right? In fact, I went to find out more than I had learned here, 
in this country about Africa because you know all, all you know is what like Femi said earlier what they get what we get in Nigeria is what you get on TV and what <coughs> we got here was the same thing Tarzan you know <laughs> images of yeah yeah stuff stuff of that nature and I discovered that not only did I have to explore and learn more about that but I also had to debunk the images of African Americans to Africans mm -hmm. In that, in that circumstance. So I think it's give and take. It's what which, was which the image happened. of African Americans? One, uh, the, the, the black exploitation films of the 60s painted us as violent, right? Our women were loose, right? So that how, how someone would approach an African American woman there would be different as, how he would, as to how he would approach one of his own women on the continent, right? So. Uh, you, you, you have to start cleaning that up and clarifying that. And you do that with your own character, with the values that you uh, inherit here. Yeah, so so you start off like, that, like, that, you start black Americans for like chef, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, you know, I think it depends on the individual, yeah. one. Yeah. Then, where or in Africa you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. You go to South place. Africa, yeah. it's different from yeah. going to Syria, you know, yeah. right. going yeah. to Nigeria. Right. You know, so, you know, it always depends. And then it depends on the kind of person you meet. I mean, whether it's an ed educated person or an uneducated person, you know, all these people have different perceptions. I mean, uh, if you read Maya Angelou, she even talks about it. Some people, Go there expecting we're going home, and when they land at the airport, they expect you know, hello, man, you know, you <laughs> should be embraced and everything. But the person you meet is a common; he wants to rob you, you know. And then when he robs you, you are so surprised. It's my brother robbing me. You know. So you know, it depends on what kind of person you are, what knowledge you have of yourself, and what you expect to get from the, the place. You know. um, I remember when I was teaching in Emory, for example, uh, I, I got um, some postcards from home, from the University of uh, Ife campus, you know, which is, you know, and the secretary of the department, he delivered the mail, you know, was asking, where is this? And I said, this is Nigeria. He said, no, no, it cannot be Nigeria. I said, but this is my department. No, no this is a lie. You know. <laughs> she didn't believe it. I'm just saying, a black woman, she never believed that, you know, that, but you, know, you don't have such places in, in Africa. And I couldn't persuade her even until I left. She said, no, you know, this is not Africa. Because <laughs> that's what she's been taught. And that's why she, she, she grew up, you know. There's an Africa of poverty and so on, which the, 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 some international agencies are exploiting to get money you know, from people, you know. Uh, the, the marketing, there's this uh, Africa of uh, poverty, need, squalor, and all that, you know. Uh, and they don't tell the truth. And we too, in Nigeria, we don't, you know, we get all kinds of ideas from films, from uh, television and so on. You know of our black brothers who are violent and war and all this, you know. So when they come, you know, the, the, the attitudes are different. Some people regard the black Americans as, uh, you know, lower class people. Why can you, you know, you can't come and talk to us. You are slaves anyway, you know. There's that kind of attitude also there. And this is why I say we haven't quite dealt with this thing in, in Africa, you know, the issue of you know, what happened. Because some of our people made enormous money selling their people, their own brothers. And they were the leaders of society. And they were the rich and so on. Just as today, some people are still selling us to the international companies, to the multinationals and so on, and making enormous money. The kind of people that uh, uh, were referred to, that the Geledes in this play were worshipping and they want to get rid of that. You know. so, that, that is, so it depends on where you go, your attitude, where you go there. You know. And on the <coughs> point of 
collective level too, when you talk about reaching out, um, like with the practice of the Afro-Brazilian communities in Brazil, um, I don't know if you heard about the king of the Yorubas, the Oni of Ife, mm -hmm. who last, last year declared Bahia as the, the headquarters of all Yorubas in, the world. in North in America. So, it's, so all of their practice has brought this about and then you have visits back and forth, there's a delegation that's going back to Brazil from, from, from IFE and the Benin Togo Republic and all of that. So more and more these connections have been made possible through the kind of reaching out or enforcing or not enforcing, but just making these practices um, frequent and also trying to keep, uh, so, sorry, trying to maintain the practices of, uh, of, of their ancestors. And this is just not because they were expecting to get embraced or anything, but this has, yeah. this has come about just from the practice over, over the years and this has brought about newer relations between Brazil, Nigeria, Brazil, Togo, Brazil, and West Africa as a whole. So it's, it's really interesting. I, I mean, I, I want to speak to the, I guess, from an American perspective, because I think it's a really great question. Um, and I know, for example, in Haiti, and I'm, the, I'm blanking out on the word, but they created a word for people like me who are Haitian but didn't grow up in Haiti, when you go there, they call you, I forgot what the word is. So you are othered in a kind of way, but it's not that we're not accepted or um, regarded in like a negative way, but we're different. And it, you know, I am different. As much as I, as proud as I am of my culture and as much as I, it's part of my life, when I go to Haiti, like I stick out. <laughs> like I'm not, I didn't grow up there. My accent's not the same. Um, but I also wonder if... Excuse me, what if, so if, if uh, the Tim interrupt to just cut us off? No, no, no. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. Well, I, I also wonder, like, when I think about hip-hop culture and how it's been embraced all over the diaspora, and that was something that was created here mm -hmm. by blacks in America, but it's really been embraced all over the world, and, you know, there is the... It is true sometimes people like a thing about a culture but don't like the people, but yeah. I think with, because it's true, but I do think with hip hop there is there's something about it, there's a reason why it's been so embraced, every, you know, in the Caribbean and Brazil, like everywhere, um, because there is something about it that speaks to all of us collectively. So for me that is one way in where there's been a reaching out, there's been, I think there was a longing to connect with Black Americans here, and somehow hip hop tapped into that. I don't know if that. Uh, you're, can, can I say, mm -hmm. uh, you're just making me think about the essential question that I heard coming up, or a statement coming out of each of the buddies, and it's one that interests me, and that is about what we do about the. Um, the people who are, who are in need of reclaiming their power. The, this language of hip hop, this language of the audience who helped to decide an ending, this language of, um, of um, connection with all of these disparate parts of, of African community. Um, how is it that, I guess what I'm, what, what I'm hopeful is that these people who have invented so much are the ones to invent the language of reclaiming power. Mm. I don't know how else to say it. Mm. Not for abuse but to let live.
Well, I suppose, um, I suppose that's what we're attempting to do in the theater. I mean, you know, narratives are important. And, um, you know, when people sort of create a new narrative, it has more possibilities that things happen, you know? Well, you know what? Not, not everybody goes to theater, but music is universal. And I, I think about uh, the young brothers and sisters in Dakar who have this great daily news show. It's maybe the most popular news show in Senegal. Yeah. And they're all about hip hop. That's where they come from, right? So the news is delivered with hip hop flavor. Uh, in French and in Wolof. And uh, there's a whole new generation of uh, young activists on the street who are pushing uh, for an end to corruption, who are pushing for re reinvention of democracy and um, uh, democratic tools uh, in, in Senegal. And that's partly fueled by the power uh, of this kind of underground media that's just bubbled up. Right, it started on the internet, but now they're on TV, right? right. Like for real, preaching uh, uh, the, the entire nation. But they're also watched in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, in Guinea, right? Because the government can't completely suppress uh, uh, everybody's uh, internet connection. Like if they try to, but people still get it on their phone. And people <laughs> who can't get it on their phone are sharing with each other right just on the street. Right, so, so there's that going on. And, and, and part of it is, we've, we've had a feedback loop for a long time involving music from the continent and the, the Caribbean and the US. Um, I'm not gonna get into it, because I could go all day, but I mean, I, you know, I, I did the, the, the DNA thing, and part of what has resulted from that is uh, relationships with cousins, long separated, right? And, and I'm in touch with them every day. So uh, in, in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Senegal, in Congo. Um, in fact, over, over the last 14 hours, 16 hours since I was last in this building, most of my contacts have actually been with them via email. Uh, other than my wife and our Togolese housemate, right? Um, uh, that, that's where my conversations have been these last few hours, right? So um, I feel very plugged in. And, and they, they have regaled me with stories about how much um, James Brown and Parliament Funkadelic meant to them growing up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Right? You know, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and amazed that, that James Brown wasn't drawing huge crowds here like he was back in Nigeria or Ghana, right? When he would visit the, the kind of, you know, what's wrong with y'all? Anyway, uh, the, 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 um, uh, you know, Music from, uh, from, from Haiti and from Cuba uh, had a, a huge impact on African artists, and then they fed it back. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, and, and my son-in-law, who is a, a, a hip-hop record producer, um, uh, you know, just hit me the other day how much um, Nigerian hip-hop artists are having an effect on uh, hip-hop artists in Brooklyn and Queens in LA now, who are, you know, digging what Nigerian artists are doing, and they're, they, so it's a feedback, feedback, feedback that's been going on for a long time. Oh, yeah. It just right. hasn't been a lot of, you know, like, uh, a broad international focus on it, but we know, yes. right, in, in our community. So, to me, that's one of the hopeful things about the, the future. We don't have to invent this connection to the continent whole cloth out of nothing. Uh, it, exactly. it, it's not like it ain't been there, it has been there. It, but it, it's going to grow stronger, and, um, uh, and, and, and it makes me hopeful about the, the future. Thanks for that, David. That's exactly, that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what the diaspora is, and that's exactly how it operates, and it is. It is a feedback group. Yeah, it is. It is. Thank you. Well, we're going to uh, unconvene now. What's next? What's next? Uh, you know, we don't we don't know. We're making this up as we go along. So, you know, it was it was you know to explore you know or, uh, you know our relationship what we could share with each other. We found it was really positive, and 
we were really happy to share the outcomes, you know, with you guys. And uh, what happens next? Um, you know, Camargo is not a producing organization, so we hope to promote these places, you know, as much as we're able. And uh, you know, that they'll go out into the world. You know, they got some the tough plays, and they got some tough writers. They can take care of themselves out there. <laughs> <laughs> that cruel world. But but um, you know, that's what we that's what we hope for. So um, we we'll keep you posted. <laughs> So thank you. Before you all split up. Should we just? Yeah, why don't you sit closer and why don't you get up and stand down? Yeah, that'd be great too. Let me see if I can get this. Oh.